Good morning. This week's parasha is Parashat Va'era, the second parasha in Sefer Shemot, the book of Exodus. In this week's parasha, we see the Egyptians begin to suffer from the 10 plagues that God will bring down on the Egyptians in the process of freeing the children of Israel from slavery. Most of the plagues are covered in this week's parasha. In the midst of the plagues, we read um, in chapter 8, verses 18 and 19, But on that day I will set apart the region of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of insects shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord. I am in the midst of the land, and I will make a distinction between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall come to pass. It is clear that God intervened directly in Egypt to keep the children of Israel safe during these plagues. It becomes more and more obvious as we read about the plagues, culminating in the 10th plague, Makat Bechorot, the um, smiting of each firstborn in the land of Egypt, where the Israelites were commanded to take blood and paint it on the doorpost so that God would skip or pass over their house. In the 21st century, it's really difficult to see how God still intervenes in our world in that way. If only real life were that simple. We see many, many plagues that affect us in the 21st century. Natural disasters such as earthquakes and tsunamis, war, famine, disease, all of these plague us in the 21st century. And we find it hard to see how God intervenes directly in our world to keep us safe. One of our greatest sages, the 12th century rabbi and philosopher, Moses ben Maimon, known as Maimonides or Rambam, elucidated 13 principles which are fundamental to our faith. Some people might view these principles as being somewhat limiting. Some people take them literally and use them to label people as heretics. I believe, however, that these principles are far from limiting. They are very powerful, a powerful restatement of our faith, and they are also empowering in a world where God's presence cannot be easily felt. One of Maimonides' principles, the third principle, is that God is non-corporeal. God is not of this world. God has no physical properties which are perceptible in this world. God cannot be affected by anything in this world. And by logical extension, God has no way of directly intervening in our world. Maimonides, far from implying that God is no longer in our world, has made it clear that it is our turn as humans to step up to the plate and to help instantiate God in this world. We are literally God's eyes, God's ears, and God's hands, and God's voice in this world. Maimonides' third principle is a call to each of us to work as God's ambassadors to bring God into this world and to instantiate God in this world. One of the plagues that affects us in the 21st century is the plague of sexual abuse. While there are lots of statistics about how prevalent sexual abuse is, I don't want to get bogged down in statistics. What seems to be agreed upon is that approximately one in five adults has been a victim of sexual abuse at some point in their lives. If you go to synagogue on a Saturday morning and you look around the sanctuary, say there are 250 people in the sanctuary, 50 of those people, whether you know it or not, 50 of those people have been victims of sexual abuse. Unless you live on a desert island, in which case I truly wonder how you have internet and are watching this video. Unless you live on a desert island, 
you certainly have friends or even family members who are victims of sexual abuse, or you may yourself be a victim of sexual abuse. It is in the midst of this plague of sexual abuse that Maimonides' third principle mandates that we as human beings step in and help to bring God into this world. It's not at all obvious how we can do that. And I want to briefly touch on the Mishnah at the end of Masachet Brachot, which can give us some guidance on how we might do this. The Mishnah is a Mishnah that talks about prayers in vain. It reads, he who prays over what has already happened, this prayer is in vain. How? If his wife was pregnant and he said, may it be your will that my wife give birth to a boy, this prayer is in vain. If he was coming on the way and heard the sound of screaming in the city, and he said, may it be your will that these are not the children of my house, this is a prayer in vain. Now this mission is commonly understood as speaking about prayers in vain in a temporal sense. In other words, the prayers might be appropriate, however, the prayers are not appropriate now because what has happened has already happened and it is too late to pray to change history. However, a question is, why are there two examples of prayers in vain? Because isn't one example sufficient? One answer is that the second prayer is not in vain because it is temporally inappropriate. It is inappropriate because it's a prayer for one's own safety at the expense of someone else's safety. After all, when I pray that this may it be God's will that these are not the members of my house. Implicit in that prayer is that somebody is suffering, and I hope that that somebody that is suffering is in someone else's house. This prayer is a prayer in vain because it shows a lack of empathy for others. One of the implicit understandings of this Mishnah is that we can help to bring God into this world and have our prayers answered by showing empathy for those who are suffering rather than distancing ourselves from them and saying we hope this does not affect us and that it affects them. When we hear about cases of sexual abuse in our communities, we all have a strong urge to do what we can so that we can have a sense of safety for ourselves and our families. One way in which we seek that sense of safety is by speaking to victims, questioning them, and finding out how they are different so that we ourselves can feel different than they, and we can feel that we are wiser than they, and we can say we will not make the same mistakes that they made. Implicit in this is that victims have made mistakes, and it is a subtle form of victim blaming. We are not purposely trying to blame victims. We are seeking to feel safe, but by doing so, we do it in a way where we blame victims. Another way that we tend to seek a sense of safety is that we deny obvious facts and we let what might be relatively limited situations escalate into much larger situations. We deny the obvious, because admitting that something is occurring means that we are not safe. Whether we admit it or not, we are not safe, but we feel that somehow putting words to what is going on makes us less safe. A final way that we can seek a sense of safety is another form of denial. Our denial is so strong that when we are told that somebody is a perpetrator of sexual abuse, we say it can't be. Again, we are not purposely denying the fact that this individual is a perpetrator of sexual abuse. We are seeking a way that we can feel safe. If we deny that something is true, we have the mistaken assumption that it is not true and that we are safe. All of these behaviors where we seek safety by isolating ourselves from the victims and denying the truth are all prayers in vain according to the Mishnah that I quoted earlier. We are seeking safety for ourselves and our families at the expense of others. We are not being supportive of victims and thereby we are not assuring our own safety and we are actually ensuring that situations continue to escalate and reducing 
our ability to be safe. In the end, these means of seeking safety make it obvious that the statistics cited above uh, are, are, are uh, as evidence of these statistics that I cited above, um, this method of safety does not work and we are not really safe. We need to work to bring God into this world and to begin to keep people truly safe from the plague of sexual abuse and many other plagues that affect our society. In order to do that, we must begin with empathy. We need to speak with victims of sexual abuse and their families rather than about them. As we continue to distance ourselves from victims of sexual abuse, we only ensure that this plague, which is already in full force, will continue on in full force, and our attempts to distance ourselves from the victims are just prayers in vain. I'm going to conclude by speaking directly to people who are victims of sexual abuse. I do not want for you to continue to live your life struggling to cope with the many long-term and terrible consequences of the abuse that you experienced. Regardless of whether civil or religious authorities are willing to step in and take you seriously, you are always worthy of our support and you are always worthy of anything that you can do for yourself and that we can do for you to help you to begin to heal from your horrific experiences. In the United States, there are two organizations which offer support 24-7. You can reach out to them at any time. The first organization is Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, R-A-I-N-N. Their toll-free hotline is 800-656-4673. The other organization is Child Help. Their toll-free number is 800-422-4453. I wish you all a Shabbat Shalom. I wish you success in your work to begin to bring God into this world. And may God help us all be successful at the healing that we all need to take part in. Shabbat Shalom.